Welcome back, geology fans. Last episode, we saw how various elements are ripped from crystals to become solutes in water in chemical weathering. But once ripped, will an element or compound go anywhere or remain nearby to possibly end up in a new mineral form? At the atomic level, ion mobility varies with the general tendency for calcium, magnesium, and sodium being the most mobile and easily removed ions, then potassium, followed by ferrous iron, reduced iron, and getting into less mobile ions, silicon, titanium, ferric, oxidized iron, and with the least mobile being aluminum. There is suggestion that the mobility of these ions is due to the ratio of the valence state divided by the atomic radius. The value of this ratio is relatively low for mobile ions in the mid to high range for immobile ions like, that like to precipitate out a solution, and really high values tend to make soluble anion complexes. But this is just a general guide and can be affected by climate and geologic conditions. For example, potassium, though relatively mobile, can get trapped in the formation of clays if the other needed constituents are present that keep potassium from really migrating too far. And the degree and relative levels of mobility of ions can be shifted mainly due to leaching, pH, the acidity, EH, the redox potential, fixation and retardation, and chelation. Leaching is the amount of water filtering through the soil and across the weathered rock surface to move any ions that end up in solution. Leaching is the most important factor in the mobility of ions and is mainly determined by climate and the permeability of the soil and rock. Leaching is the most important mobility factor not just for removing solutes, but by adding new hydrogen to the mineral surfaces, affecting the pH of the solution to determine which minerals are still soluble, and moves ions mostly downward into new chemical regimes where they may precipitate as new minerals, thus chemically separating out layers or horizons of soil. If leaching stops due to a lack of rainfall, the chemical weathering surfaces become closed systems, only weathering to a chemical equilibrium with any remaining water, after which no further chemical weathering takes place. This is why arid areas have soil that have the more mobile ions, like calcium or sodium, plus all the others that were there originally, while humid tropical areas have all the mobile elements removed even silicon, and can weather into a tropical soil called bauxite, which is an ore for ferric iron and aluminum, which are the elements that remain behind after intense leaching. pH is affected by leaching and is most important in determining which elements are soluble in the leaching water. This chart shows the solubility of common substances and can be read with the inside of the curves, the concave side being insoluble, and the outside, convex side of the curve being soluble range. Rutile, TiO2, is only soluble at pH 2.5 or lower. That's really acidic. And titanium is not very mobile. Corundum is soluble below pH 5 or above 8. Most natural groundwater will have pH of 6 to 8.5, which means well, calcite will be generally soluble, and thus the high mobility of calcium, but ferric hydroxide is rarely soluble and helps ferric oxide be one of the less mobile ions. But ferrous oxide is soluble, so Fe2 plus is more mobile. And keep in mind that the very process of weathering minerals can alter pH. The calcite in limestones will raise pH when the disassociated carbonate ion grabs a hydrogen to become bicarbonate. Calcite can raise pH faster than other minerals with this potential, like many micas and clays. Other minerals, like the metal sulfides, galena or more commonly pyrite, can lower pH as we see in this formula in which oxidizing pyrite releases sulfuric acid twice as many molecules of sulfuric acid produced for every molecule of pyrite consumed, and an equal number of molecules of iron hydroxide. With a large amount of pyrite exposed to air, like mine spoil piles, 
leaching water can get down to a pH below 2.5 and start mobilizing the ferric iron and titanium even. But slowly, the acidic water buffers by reaction with other minerals and oxidizes with water-air interactions until the iron hydroxide drops out as that yellow boy hematite staining. Similarly, EH is not an independent variable. It depends on leaching and minerals present. In environments that vary between reduction and oxidation, like around a fluctuating groundwater table, the reversibility of redox reactions can be like a traffic light causing elements to stop and go and stop and go as redox fluctuates from red to green, especially for elements like iron or titanium. Recall that reduced iron is more mobile than oxidized iron, but iron also gives an example of how oxidation can increase mobility through weathering. Reduced ferrous iron can bind with silica tetrahedra to make ferromagnesian minerals like olivine or pyroxene, but when oxidized, the ferrous iron turns to ferric iron and no longer fits in the crystal lattice, thus disrupting it and easily releasing oxidized iron to rust the environment. Oxidation can also increase mobility of some ions by altering pH. As we have already seen in the production of sulfuric acid when pyrite or galena oxidizes. So again, EH and pH are far from being independent variables. Fixation and retardation are not easy to explain from basic principles beyond saying that certain elements just seem to be the right size and charge to fit into secondary minerals formed from weathering, and we're talking mostly clays here. Calcium and sodium just don't seem to fit into clay crystal lattice sites as easily as potassium or magnesium. Studies of highly weathered subtropical soils show almost no calcium nor sodium left in the soil, but potassium and magnesium were present and appear relatively unchanged from the original concentrations. It should be noted that minerals of similar crystal structure are more stable, more resistant to weathering, if potassium is present. Uh, muscovite sticks around in the soil longer than biotite, and K-spar lasts longer than plagioclase feldspar. This takes us to our last mobility factor, which can be very important in getting elements that might appear to be absolutely immobile to mobilize. Chelation. Chelation involves taking a charged metal and surrounding it in a cocoon of complexing agents. The chemical agents are usually organic fulvic acids, which as you break vegetation down, you'll get the larger humic acids first, and then the smaller fulvic acids, which can group around the metal ion, bringing it to equilibrium and making it soluble. Lichens actually produce chelating agents without having to decay into fulvic acids, and they've been around for about 250 million years. Land plants have been around for at least 400 million years, and algal ligands have been found to act as chelation agents, so chelation has been present for most of geologic history, but became a more important process in the last month of Earth's geologic year, especially on land where soil forms. This is one of the most well-known chelating agents, ethylene diamine tetraacetate, or EDTA. As you can see, the chelating agents like EDTA have multiple bonds with the otherwise too reactive and thus usually immobile metal ion, uh, cobalt in this case. But any other metal can be mobilized by chelation with iron, and aluminum being some of the most important and common. More iron is released from hematite and magnetite when treated with a chelating agent like EDTA than when immersed in more acidic HCl. When you take an iron supplement, if you're anemic, you take chelated iron. And when you need to add iron to your fertilizer mix, that too is chelated iron, which allows ferric iron to remain in an available form for soil. Once oxidized, the chelate complex is soluble in water and will be able to transport metals down the soil profile to possibly redeposit them when microbes break down the chelates or the ionic properties of the water changes with further reactions. So, those are the ways that elements and molecules can be moved through forming soils. 
Leaching is the main driver determining which direction these materials are moved, which is mostly downward, especially in humid areas, but can be upward in arid areas where water rises until it evaporates. Elements and molecules are put into motion as rocks and minerals chemically weather, and most of these materials end up in more stable clays. When we come back next time, we will look at these clays, the types, the structures and characteristics, and how to use these clays to determine if the soil is relatively young or show signs of long-developed decomposition. Here on Earth Explorations.